Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Becky Seabrook, and I am the Senior Director of Guest Engagement here at the Health Museum. I want to welcome all of you for joining us for our Coffee and Conversations program this afternoon. Um, normally, this is a, a program that we do have in person, but as we all know, we've been doing a lot more virtually, so I hope you have your, your cup of coffee and are, are joining us from, from your living room, from your office, from wherever you are right now. Um, I am really excited to be doing this program today uh, in conjunction with some of our, our wonderful partners. We're so blessed here in this area and in, in Houston to have such an incredible, incredible medical community. So um, our partners today include um, the UT Health School of Public Health, UTMB Health, and the uh, Institute for Translational Sciences, Baylor College of Medicine, and the Gulf Coast Center for Precision Environmental Health. So thank you so much um, for helping us make this program possible on a really important topic, um, everything you want and need to know about the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, there is a, a ton of conversation happening in our community and this is really a great opportunity for us all to, to get together with some people that are doing incredible work here in our community and, and have some of those questions answered. Um, we do ask that everyone remain on mute for, um, for the program, but by all means, if you have questions that you would like um, to share with, with our guests today, please go ahead and put those in the chat and we will be monitoring it. Um, we will also be going ahead and, and streaming this to our, um, our Facebook account for the Health Museum in case you want to refer back to the, the talk today or if you want to share it with any of your friends, family, or, or acquaintances. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I am so happy to introduce the guests that we have with us today, um, starting with Dr. Stephen Linder. Um, Dr. Linder is a professor in the Department of Management, Policy, and Community Health and director of the Institute for Health Policy at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston School of Public Health. Um, he is also an associate faculty member at the Center for Humanities and Ethics at the McGovern School of Medicine and is formerly the associate director of Health Policy Institute at the Texas Medical Center. So a very, a very busy man. Um, he holds a, a doctorate in political science that he received from the University of Iowa and has held faculty appointments at other universities, including UCLA and Tulane, before joining um, UT School of Public Health. Dr. Linder has been recognized for teaching excellence as a Minnie Stevens Piper professor and holds the title of Distinguished Teaching Professor and um, fellow at the Kenneth I. Shrine Academy of Health Science Education for the University of Texas System. Dr. Linder's research, which includes leadership positions on a number of different surveys, including the Health of Houston 2018 survey, the Healthy Cities Research Hub, and Global Cities for Changing Diabetes. Um, all of this focuses on community-based needs and health risks, specializing in um, cumulative risk characterization, needs assessment, and measurement. So Dr. Linder, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, our, second, uh, our second member of our, our conversation today is Dr. Troisi, Dr. Catherine Troisi. She is an associate professor in the Division of Management, Policy, and Community Health and Epidemiology at the University of Texas School of Public Health and the coordinator for the Leadership Theory and Practice Certificate. She's previously served as Assistant Director at the Houston Health Department. She teaches courses in public health and leadership and has research interests in infectious disease epidemiology. Her, uh, her degrees include a BA in chemistry from the University of Rochester, a master's in biochemistry from Michigan State, and her doctorate in epidemiological sciences from the University of Michigan. Um, Dr. Chwisi, thank you so much for, for joining us today. I know you were very busy recently as well with everything that's going on. And finally, our, our third uh, member of our, our conversation today is Dr. David Peirce. Um, he is the Director of Emergency Medical Services and the Public Health Authority for the City of Houston. He is a Professor of Medicine and Surgery at the Baylor College of Medicine, an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at the University of Texas Medical School in Houston. After numerous residencies and, and fellowships in, in um, emergency medicine, he returned to Houston in 1996 to assume the role of Director of Emergency Medical Services for the city. 
and in 2004 was appointed by the city council as Houston's public health authority and has been a very incredible one. We're very lucky to have you, Dr. Purse. So without further ado, let's go ahead and, and jump into a conversation about the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, there is a, a ton of conversation going on in the community. Um, a lot of those questions, including ones that we were getting here at the museum, have to do with um, eligibility for the vaccines, which are, are limited in number right now, and access to them. So I was wondering maybe if we could get started with, with eligibility and, and who is and who is not eligible right now. Um, Dr. Purse, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. So the, the state has set the priorities. Um, we've been hearing about the 1A group and the 1B group. And the 1A group is, uh, when you go to the actual form, you can Google it, you can find it, but to boil it down, it is frontline workers, people taking care of COVID patients, predominantly in the hospital, but also uh, people that are caring for uh, folks in nursing homes, and as well as the EMS workers who are actually staffing an ambulance. So really trying to get those people who are, by virtue of their employment, uh, two characters. One, they're at really high risk of contracting. Number two is we really, as a society, cannot afford for them to get sick and go offline. That's the 1A group. The 1B group is persons over the age of 65 and anyone else over the age of 18 with one of nine diagnoses, which puts them at a uh, really higher risk of suffering negative consequences should they become infected with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Now, I noticed that the um, the City of Houston Emergency Operations Center has a really um, a wonderful website, and, and we'll go ahead and we'll share that with the group for anyone that hasn't seen it. That does answer a lot of the questions that people might have in terms of, of what they need to, what, what to expect um, if they are in fact eligible and can get the vaccines. Um, Dr. Purse, can you talk about some of the things that they, they need to have when, um, in order to, to sign up for a vaccine? When you sign up for the vaccine, we're going to obviously, you know, need your name. We're going to need a phone number because we're going to try to communicate with you through your phone. So not only do we need your phone, we also, ironically, people think, we didn't know what your phone carrier is because in order for us to send text messages and stuff, sometimes that makes a difference. So that's an odd question people don't expect. We'll ask for your address. Um, and then we're going to ask you, you know, you know, which group that you belong to in order to be, whether it be 1A or 1B. And probably we need to capture the demographics and the state is requiring that we report this back to them as to how we're using the vaccine. Um, so those are the basic sorts of things that you'll be asked for. Mm -hmm. And then in, in terms of knowing where to get vaccine, that's a question that we're seeing a lot of people are asking, where can I get the vaccine if I'm eligible? Um, I, I did notice that the state does have a website, both in English and Spanish that shows some of the providers um, that anticipate having vaccines. Um, if someone is, is, is trying to figure out who to sign up through, um, what, is, what, is the best, what is the best approach for that? Yeah, so this is a really good question. There's a, there's a lot of confusion about it. And it has to do, there's, there's no bad actor here. I just don't want anyone to think that I'm throwing anybody under the bus, but the way this evolved may, became problematic, predominantly in terms of the uh, vaccine supply. So when the vaccine first came available, it was the Pfizer vaccine, which requires the super cold storage. So there are only a limited number of places which could accommodate that. And those are mostly hospitals. But that was okay at that time because the 1A group was predominantly hospital and other healthcare workers. So that was a good match. And a lot of vaccine went to those, to those hospitals. Uh, the next week, the Moderna vaccine became available, which did require uh, really extraordinary storage requirements and it could go to many more places. And so the state sent a lot of vaccine out to many, many places. In fact, if you look at the page or the, the, the website for the, uh, where, who got vaccine for several weeks, it's 24 pages long with maybe 25 or 30 locations on each page. So vaccine went out to many, many, many places. Um, then a couple of things happened which hadn't really been anticipated. One was that amongst the healthcare workers, initially there wasn't the uptake of vaccine that the hospitals had expected that their employees would want. And so then they were left with extra vaccine, if you will. Well, we're not gonna let any vaccine sit in a freezer. So they started moving ahead with expanding who in their healthcare environment could get vaccinated. And about the same time, the state came out with the 1B authorization. So you've seen some hospitals are reaching out, Methodist, for example, chose to reach out to their patients that were age 75 and older, and then they prioritize those with the, the most significant things. Now, that's a little bit different from the 1B, but that was the decision that Methodist, as an example, made. That was a very smart move on their part. Um, 
and then other hospitals had more uptake and so they had less left over. So they were able to do the same thing to the same degree. So what happened was we've had a lot of people saying, hey, listen, I'm 67 years old and I've got type two diabetes and hypertension and I can't get it, yet my neighbor was able to get it, no problem. And so the reality is, is that systems moved along a little bit faster than other systems and that has created some confusion. And then to make it more complicated, was the nursing homes and the long-term care facilities who had signed up with the federal program, it came up time for them to get their vaccine. And so the federal government told the state, you need to take from your existing delivery schedule and you need to divert a bunch of vaccine over to the nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Well, of course, those are very deserving places that really need the vaccine. But what it did was it took the amount of vaccine that was getting sent out across the state and it drove it down for a couple of weeks and now it should be coming back up again. So the long winded uh, answer to your question, when you go to the website that you're talking about, it will show uh, on that web page, the one with the map and all the dots on it, places that are eligible to get a vaccine. What it unfortunately does not always have um, in it is whether or not that place has vaccine today or not. And right now, because we're just coming off the tail end of all this vaccine being diverted to the nursing homes, many of them uh, do not have vaccine. In fact, you know that last week, the week before, the only places that got vaccine here locally or Harris County Public Health, Houston Health Department, and Methodist Hospital. That should change. I, I can't speak for the state. I don't know exactly when that will change, but I anticipate very soon we will see the vaccine going out to all the other providers again very shortly. I noticed one of the, the features that was on the, the city website was um, an alert system where people could sign up to get either emails or texts or calls with updates. Is that is that being used in order to get information out as vaccines come in? Um, yeah, so I'm not, that's not tightly in my lane, so I'm going to give you the answer I think is correct, but I, I think that you are correct, because I get those alerts as well, um, and uh, people do need to sign up for those, so you need to go to the city's webpage and you need to sign up to get those alerts. Yeah, I anticipate like any any situation that has so many moving parts like this, um, that, that the logistics are, are, are pretty incredible and that it may take some time to figure out to, to kind of um, to smooth out the process. Um, but it but it is a pretty incredible process. I mean, just just looking at the, the fact that we have a vaccine within a year of the, the starting is, is quite amazing. Um, I, I use the analogy that we're building this ambulance while it's already going <laughs> hard on the road. So. Right. I imagine it feels a lot like that. Um, we know where we are now in terms of, of who's eligible. Can any of you speak to um, what we might what we might be able to expect in terms of when the next group, the, the 1C group might be eligible? Or we, we've had some questions about when, is, when are people that um, are not, uh, fall into more of the, the general public that are not eligible because of age or, or underlying conditions, when might, might we expect vaccinations to be available widely for groups like that? Well, let me interject that uh, we did some, some work trying to estimate uh, how many people throughout Harris County, including the city of Houston, fell into the 1B category. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we looked at chronic disease prevalence and we looked at um, uh, those who are 65 and older and so on, trying to get the full population estimates from a demographic perspective. And it turns out to be about just over 1.6 million people. Mm -hmm. and, and so you can watch then the tide of the vaccine as it rises, mm -hmm. being able to um, uh, attend to all of the, the folks who have been prioritized in that 1B category. And as we get closer and closer to about a million and a half doses out in the population, um, uh, you can expect then to um, see the, the 2A or the 1C being introduced. And, mm -hmm. and it's likely then to include some occupational designations, which hadn't been part of the categorization beyond healthcare workers. Um, uh, they'll probably uh, be part of this as they are in some other states, but not in Texas as yet. And this is, I think Dr. Percy had mentioned that this is a state level decision in terms of eligibility. Is that correct, Dr. Linder? Yes, it is. Okay. So it, it may take some time, but do we, do we know when um, in terms of uh, months down the line, we might expect something to be more readily available for the general population? So the federal government has been saying um, to expect April. 
But it was also the federal government who said that we would have, you know, 20 million people vaccinated by the end of the year. So in reality, this is this is rolling out a little bit slower than had been anticipated. So right now I'm hoping for April, but if it's May, I won't be surprised. Got it. We have had a number of questions from people that are eligible for the for the vaccine and have actually received the first dose, but have questions about the second dose, um, including just logistics of, of what to expect, um, whether they need to schedule a follow-up appointment with the city or if the city is going to reach out and do a follow-up. Um, Dr. Percival, we have you. Can you speak a little bit to how the city of Houston is handling those follow-up appointments? Yes. Yeah, so earlier I said that we were going to need to get a phone number from you and your carrier. And so the, the plan now is that we will reach out to you. And, and part of it is we have to have vaccine to give you. So with your second dose, we're going to reach out to you once we have vaccine for the second doses and work with you to schedule a time and, and which of our locations would be most convenient for you. to get it. Now, I, I said that's how the city's doing it. You know, the hospitals and the county and others are, are you know, quite possibly going to do it a little bit differently. And, uh, but that's how the city's doing it. Got it. In terms of people that have received the first dose, there were some people that had questions about it and are concerned that they, um, would they receive the same type of vaccine for the second dose? Um, or is there an issue if there was a delay with the second dose? Can, can you spike, uh, speak to either of those concerns that, that people are, are, are writing about? Sure. So you should get uh, the second dose, whether it's a Pfizer or Moderna, you want to make sure you get the second dose from the same manufacturer. Okay. There is a trial going on in Europe right now looking at mixing, but that trial is not done yet. So we don't, we don't know. So the, the manufacturers, they only tested their uh, vaccine using obviously two doses of their own vaccine. So you, we should stick with that for, for now. The manufacturers are also saying that you should get the second dose within uh, no more than four days early from your, so with the Moderna, it's 28 days. So no, no sooner than the 24th day and no later than four days afterwards. Now the, in Canada, however, they have decided and their um, uh, CDC equivalent has come out and said it can be up to 42 days, I'm sorry, 48 days from the, uh, the first dose. But we don't have that here in the United States now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I also know that again in Europe, they're looking at trial of seeing if, you know, if it's longer until you get the second dose, um, what kind of a problem? You may have heard that the UK has made a decision to extend that uh, quite some time in an effort to get more first doses into people. The, the, the question is, and perhaps Dr. Linder or Dr. Teresi will know, and Dr. Teresi is, you know, just a, a wealth of knowledge. And so perhaps in all of her scouring of the literature, which she does on a daily basis, she may have come across this, maybe not, but, but you know, your, your first dose will give you some degree of, of immunity is, you know, we believe, right? But the second dose is the one that really hits it home. The question everybody has is, was well, that a little bit more or is that a whole lot more? And I personally, I've heard both. So I don't know, Dr. Teresi, have you got any better insight on that? Yeah, well, I think it depends on the person. Um, the results from the phase three trials showed that about 50% had antibodies. Um, I think it was 10 days, I forget, after the first dose. Um, that goes up to 95% and a higher level of antibodies. When we have talked about um, giving out first doses and not worrying about the second dose right now um, until vaccine becomes more available, one of the issues with that is that we don't know how long antibodies after that first dose last. Antibodies just naturally decline. And uh, one dose may not be enough to get it up high enough to protect you for any length of time. The other concern is about immune selection uh, in that if you have partial immunity to this variant, <coughs> I'm sorry, to the, um, the virus that's circulating right now, not the variant, that um, it may allow variants to reproduce um, selectively. And so that's a concern also with delaying the second dose. Um, Dr. Tracy, you were um, talking about an, an antibody response. Will anyone who's received the COVID, COVID vaccine test positive for antibodies or will it be somewhat like what we're seeing with having the virus itself that not everybody tests positive for antibodies? So we don't have a whole lot of um, information 
on that with the rollout. We know during the clinical trials, again, about 95% of people did have an antibody response. Um, but that's under very controlled conditions. That's the efficacy of the vaccine. The effectiveness of the vaccine is what we calculate when you roll it out into the real world. And, you know, we, we just don't have those data yet. It's one of the reasons why even after you've received your second dose, uh, you are still going, you, you cannot assume that you are protected and um, you are still going to need to wear a mask and socially distance and do all the things you're hopefully doing now to prevent um, spread of the virus. We, um, the vaccine trials that were done uh, tested whether or looked at whether um, recipients of the vaccine had um, any symptoms of COVID infection. And again, most, you know, 95% did not, but uh, what it did not look at and what is being looked at right now is whether people who are vaccinated can have an asymptomatic infection and transmit that infection to others. So until we have those data, it's, it's gonna be really important that people still wear their mask. Uh, and again, you know, you can't assume you're in that 95%. We don't know, we know that the vaccines work pretty well in people over 65 who usually do not respond to vaccines as well because our immune systems like every other organ in your body, I speak from experience, starts to decline after 65. Um, but we don't know about people with certain comorbid conditions. Is the vaccine less effective in, in um, those people? So it, you cannot assume that you're protected um, mm -hmm. after receiving two doses. Can, you're can, can I add something? So one thing that I think for the audience to understand is that when you get your first dose of vaccine, and, and also I want to point out that when you were a child, you may not remember it, but you got several vaccines in two dose sequences, right? So the first dose of the vaccine simulates your, it, it, your immune system basically knows, I know what is me and anything else that's not me isn't supposed to be here. And so when you first get the vaccine, it's first introduced to something that is not you and isn't supposed to be here. And so that's when you can get some immunoglobulins, you get some antibody response with that. But what you really want, and this is what comes to the second dose, is you want the stimulation, well, actually it's the creation of the memory cells in your immune system that will give you the long-term and it looks like with these vaccines, what I've read is that it's the second shot that really stimulates the development of the memory cells. The first shot will get you some immunoglobulins, some antibodies, um, and, and, and you know, a, a degree of immune response. But that may, that may peter out after a few months because you haven't really given it enough mm -hmm. to stimulate the generation of the memory cells. And that's why you need that second dose. And we've had a couple of questions on, on that topic about what is the difference between the first and the second dosage? Is the dosage of the vaccination the same? It's just the response in the body is different? That's right, yeah. yes. Okay. Um, you, you're bringing up a really interesting point about all of the research that's happening as, as we go. And I, I think it's very interesting because one of the things that we've noticed at the museum and people's response to COVID in general, not just the vaccines, but COVID in general is a frustration about changing recommendations. And I think from the scientific community, the fact that recommendations would change as data comes out makes a lot of sense. But I think it's led to frustration from people that, that may not be part of a scientific community or, or may not have that sense. Are you seeing, are you seeing that as well? Yeah, I, I, I think it's a misunderstanding of how science works. And, um, you know, we, we do experiments, we find a result, but you don't go with just that one result. It has to be replicated. Sometimes new data comes out. And so, um, you know, we have made remarkable progress in the last year understanding this virus. We have a vaccine, we have tests, we have a few um, therapeutics. Uh, but um, s science uh, can work slowly. Um, and, and part of the problem, uh, in, in my opinion, is that because preprints that have not been peer reviewed have been released to the public, um, the public gets a misunderstanding about what the science has actually shown um, because it hasn't been vetted through the scientific community yet. We don't usually do that. Yeah. Um, usually we wait for peer review. 
Yeah, that that um, reminds me, one of the people that has submitted a question had a very specific question about a medical condition. And I think the person was exactly right in going to the doctor and talking to the doctor about whether their condition, um, whether they should move forward with getting the vaccine or not. Um, can you, but, but was asking, well, what are, what are the recommendations? And I don't think in, in this particular conversation, we can spe uh, speak to specific, um, specific individuals and medical conditions, but can you talk a little bit about how the medical community is getting this information? Like how are doctors making the decision about whether or not their patients should move forward with the vaccine or not if they have certain conditions, underlying conditions that might be problematic? We're, we're listening to Dr. Shoisi. No, uh, <laughs> I say that because Dr. Shoisi will think that your voters are about twice a week. She goes through the current literature and does these little uh, brief synopses of what's important and sends that out to many, many physicians across town. So uh, thank you, Dr. Shoisi, for doing that. But so to answer the question is we, we look to the CDC to give us that, that guidance. Um, the, the challenge is, and this is a little bit what Dr. Shoisi was talking about, is with peer reviewed literature being um released before it's truly peer-reviewed mm -hmm. you know that puts it it's kind of putting the cart in front of the horse in terms of you know the cdc is now playing catch up as well and so um i think most of us are, are waiting to get the recommendations either from predominantly the cdc if it's medical and the more operational things are coming from the state like the the phase 1a and phase 1b that's more of an operational uh, strategic decision as opposed to a scientific medical decision the yeah. recommendation um, Dr. Linder, I'm, I'm wondering if you, you could talk to um, some of the um, people's attitudes towards, towards vaccines, particularly in, in maybe some of the different communities. Um, one of the questions that, that we had had to do with um, someone who had a friend within the medical community, but they themselves weren't sure that they wanted to get the vaccine yet and wondering if, if someone knew something they didn't or if um, we've had questions from people that would, were concerned about whether or not the vaccine being developed so quickly meant that it wasn't necessarily being developed safe, safely um, and, and had some hesitancy about whether or not to go forward with getting it. Can you speak to that at, at all about what you're seeing in, in the community? Sure, there, there's generally two responses on the part of those who are reluctant um, within the health professions. And, and one has to do with um, uh, concern about the side effects of actually taking the vaccine and that might affect their ability to serve, to be online, to, and maybe they're a respiratory therapist who doesn't have a replacement. And, and if they get sick and are out multiple days, how then does that service get covered? And, and there's been an effort to try and stagger the vaccine um, deployment in the uh, health community in order to ensure that uh, not an entire service is laid off because of um, uh, vaccine side effects. Um, there is reluctance too that comes out of the idea that um, maybe it's not yet proven that um, the vaccine is worthwhile and so you want to wait and see. And, and it's as though there was a sense that it was um, taken through shortcuts and that the full trial was not completed or something. But the real difference between these trials for these vaccines and other trials that have gone on for the last 25 years is the amount of money involved. Mm -hmm. There was a huge infusion of capital and a pre-purchasing of the products of these trials ahead of time that really jump-started the entire process. So it wasn't about pharmaceuticals having to bring in private investment and convince investors as the trial was unfolding and having all of that take place over time where the money was being gathered as the trials were undergoing and then seeing whether or not it would eventually work. There was confidence that this would work ahead of time and huge amounts of capital went into getting it as quickly as possible. And, and as possible means uh, according to the conventional designs that have been validated for the testing of the, the efficacy and safety of products like these vaccines. Mm -hmm. 
One of the questions that that has just come in uh, has to do with some of the other vaccines. So right now we we have the the two vaccines in in the area that have that 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 approval. Um, is there any sense of what the timeline might look like for additional vaccines to be approved? Because it's my understanding there's actually quite a few that are that are in um, in development right now. I bet Kathy knows. Yes. Yeah, sorry, my phone keeps ringing. I don't know how to make it stop my desktop. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll I'll drop it in the bathtub. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there are some other vaccines using different modalities on the horizon, which is good because one of them only requires one dose right now, although there are trials going on looking at two doses. Um, that's a Johnson & Johnson using an adenovirus, which is a it cause, causes a common cold, among other things, um, as a vector to bring in part of the COVID-19 virus. You can't get COVID-19 from any of these vaccines. It's, the virus simply isn't there. The, the part of the virus that we make antibodies to. Um, and that um, does not have to be stored at you know very low temperatures, um, would be much easier to um, to give out. The AstraZeneca um, vaccine is another one using adenovirus um, that may be approved within the next month, but the clinical trials were a little um, confusing because it looked like people who got half the dose for the first one did better than um, people who got the full dose for the first dose. So th there's a little bit of confusion there. And then there's another vaccine um, that is undergoing testing right now that is a typical vaccine where um, for, like other vaccines that we have that use just a little bit of protein. Um, and if that worked well, that would be very easy to administer. It may require more uh, booster doses, but certainly storage wise would be easier. So we're hoping in another month or two that we'll have emergency use authorization of at least another vaccine. And when we were talking earlier about when more widespread vaccine will be available, that's going to be part of the you know, solution is to have more uh, types of vaccine out there. Now the two well, vaccines, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Choi. I saw a question in the chat about should you wait for a certain vaccine? And the answer is no. You should get you know, if, if you have the opportunity to get vaccinated, um, get vaccinated now, don't wait for a theoretical vaccine to come on the, on the horizon. Now, another question that we've had, um, I, I know that had come in before, had to do with the current vaccines that we have. Uh, there's a lot of conversation about the mRNA vaccines, kind of how they work and, and whether or not that they can impact our, our, our DNA in our body. Um, can, can one of you uh, address um, a, address the kind of the misunderstanding around the, the mRNA vaccine and how they work? Yes, so uh, messenger RNA. First of all, one of the other reasons besides what Dr. Linder was talking about that we were able to get these vaccines uh, ready so quickly uh, is that messenger RNA vaccines, although none had been licensed for use in humans, work had been done on that. And they're very easy to manipulate to, against new um, viruses. And um, so messenger RNA codes for proteins. That is, it tells your cells here, make this protein. And in, for these vaccines, it says here, make this spike protein for the coronavirus. And then it gets released out into your body. Your immune system sees it. It says, hey, this isn't me. I better mount a defense. And you make antibodies and, and these memory T cells. And I mean, your immune system is very complex. But that's you know the basic thing. Messenger RNA can it stays in the cytoplasm of your cell. It does not go into the nucleus of your cell where the DNA is. So first of all, it's not anywhere near your DNA. Even if it did get into the nucleus of your cell, humans make RNA from DNA. We do not make DNA from RNA. That requires a specific um, um, enzyme called reverse transcriptase. There are certain viruses, for example, HIV, that have reverse transcriptase. We don't have it. So there's no way we could make DNA from this messenger RNA. 
Yeah, that's, I think it's bringing us a lot of us back to to seventh grade biology and, and high school biology is remembering where things are in the cell. Um, a question has popped up about um, about children. Right now, I believe the vaccines are uh, recommended for people over the ages of 16 or 18, depending on the vaccine. Can you talk about um, why it's not recommended for children and if we anticipate at some point in time, children might be eligible for it, particularly if they have underlying health conditions that might make them um, candidates for, for a more serious infection? The reason it's not recommended is because those clinical trials simply haven't been done. They are ongoing right now. So at a certain time period, um, I fully anticipate it will be licensed in younger children. Now, Dr. Linda, I know one of the things that um, we had been talking about had to do with some of these new variants that, that we're seeing um, popping up in, in different countries and in different communities, uh, different strains of, of the virus. And there's been a lot of talk about concern as to whether or not the, the vaccines will work against some of these, um, some of these other strains. What, what do we know about that right now? That's probably a Dr. Troisi question. She can deal with the variants. But my, um, my concern is that somehow the proliferation of variants um, as the mutations occur with greater transmission rates that we're seeing in this third wave um, will discourage people from getting the vaccines. And, and nothing could be further from what people ought to be doing. They ought to be seeking out the vaccines because eventually the vaccines will actually st help stamp out the, the reproduction of these variants in, in different forms. Mm -hmm. Kathy? Uh, yeah, yeah, Kathy or Dr. Purse, did either of you want to add to that? I'll let so, Dr. Therese to go first. So we know that um, we know the coronavirus is an RNA virus. You know, we have humans have both RNA and DNA. Viruses have one or the other. Coronavirus has RNA. And um, RNA, when it um, reproduces, replicates, it tends to make mistakes. We call in, you know, so that there's a change in, in one of the amino acids. We call that a mutation. Most mutations um, uh, mean that the virus can't survive. But occasionally, there are mutations that enhance the infectivity, for example, that make it um, may, we have not seen this, but potentially could make it more dangerous, um, you know, changes that we would not want to see. Uh, right now, it looks like the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines protect against two of the variants. The Great Britain one that we've seen in the United States is we don't know exactly how common it is here because we haven't done a lot of uh, ge uh, genetic sequencing of the viruses that we're isolating. Um, and, um, and the, but, but it appears that, that the vaccines work against that variant and also against the um, South African variant. What we don't know yet is there's another variant um, from Brazil and we're not sure about that one yet. The reason we've been seeing so many variants is not that they weren't there before. It's, you know, seek and ye shall find. Um, that, that's just the nature of RNA viruses, like influenza is an RNA virus. And, um, you know, we see changes every year. So, so far, we have no evidence that the vaccines don't protect against the variants, but of course, we're watching it very carefully. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, piggyback on what uh, Dr. Linder said and, and what Dr. Tree said. So I think that people need to understand is that the, our biggest risk right now is that there be another variant that comes along which uh, doesn't respond uh, to, well, to, that the, uh, the vaccine will not protect us against, right? That's what we don't want to have happen. But every day that passes with people being infected and replicating the virus gives that, uh, gives the virus another day and another person and within a person, you know, there's millions of replications that occur, so millions of opportunities for the vaccine, for the virus to mutate the way we don't want it to. So what we really need to do as a global community is get as many people vaccinated as we can so that we slow down the, the virus and therefore minimize the chance that a variant will occur that will not be covered by the vaccine. 
Okay, if I could um, look at a couple of questions that we have coming in from some of the people joining us today. Um, one has um, asked a question about if two individuals of a similar age and demographic take one of the vaccines and one has mild or no symptoms while the other has fever, exhaustion, or body aches, does that mean the one who had the greater symptoms has a better or stronger immune system? So that's a tricky question. Um, <laughs> Because the, you know, because um, part of your reaction to the vaccine will have to do with, you know, how, how your immune system. It, it will also have to do a lot with if you're if you so if you were somebody who was previously infected with COVID and maybe you had no symptoms and you didn't know it when you get your first COVID shot, you're more likely to have some symptoms than maybe somebody who didn't. So it, it may have something to do with how your immune system, how how vigorous your immune system responds. It may have something to do with whether or not you were previously infected with um, with COVID and didn't even know it. So, what is what is the recommendation either for people that think they may have had COVID but hadn't been tested, or for people that actually did have COVID? What is the recommendation on whether or not to get a vaccine? So, the recommendation is you get vaccinated. It kind of goes back to something we said earlier. With your first exposure to the virus, you're going to get some degree of an immune response, your immune system, but it may not be that long term with the generation of lots of memory cells. So even if you had it before, you still need to go ahead and get vaccinated um, in order to really drive it home in your mind because you don't want to catch it again, right? So, um, uh, and, and we've seen that. We've seen people who were infected twice. We've seen people who had mild symptoms the first time they got infected and got really sick the second time. We've had people who got really sick the first time and really sick the second time. So um, you definitely, if you, if you had it before, if you know, or you think, or you maybe did, um, you, in your opportunity to come up and get vaccinated. If it's me, I'm getting vaccinated. One of the things that, that we've seen, been seeing with the data is that um, this disease is, is really wrecking havoc and, and having a particularly um, strong impact on a lot of um, people in communities of color, whether it's a Latino community or, um, or African-Americans. How are we doing as a, a community as a whole on making sure that some people that are, are sort of more um, likely to have severe cases and things like that are act are being able to access the vaccines. Is that is that something that the city has been focusing on? Yeah. So you've actually asked two questions in there. One you asked about um, people who are more likely to catch the virus, mm -hmm. and also those who are more likely to have serious consequences of it. So let me sort of address those uh, separately. So. As we track the data in Houston and we do the positivity rates, we map it out by zip code. And we know the demographics of those zip codes. And yes, we've been saying this for some time, we've been seeing higher rates of positivity rates in income, in zip codes that tend to have people who are um, of lower income, people who have multiple jobs, people who live with multiple generations in the same dwelling. Those tend to be people of color, but I think it's important people know that at this point, there does not appear to be anything genetically different about African Americans versus Latinx versus Asian versus white that puts you at a greater risk. There are some diseases where that's the case. That does not appear to be the case here. What does appear to be the case is the people of color also tend to have, you know, lower income, multi generational dwellings. They work multiple jobs. They're very often public facing jobs where they're going to be coming across with many more people per day, and so that's what puts them at greater risk of being in infected. So we, with the health department, is we're looking where we're going to try to target vaccine. We're tracking those zip codes that have people. Who, we combine two things. We combine your higher risk of contracting the virus. Also, we also have some health demographics per zip code as well. And when we find those zip codes that have both of those risk factors, that's where we're going to try to, once we get vaccine, that's where we're going to try to target it. Dr. Linder. The, uh, the, the county has also um, have uh, made some plans to deal with the communities that have had a large cumulative burden of disease since um, uh, early on. So since uh, February on through um, uh, this January, there have been some communities that um, have sustained a large number of days at a very high rate of, um, of infection in their community. And there's some effort on the, on the part of the uh, county uh, public health department um, to um, enable mobile uh, of vaccination. And, and once uh, more vaccine is available, uh, they'll begin uh, distributing vaccine um, 
to those communities in those communities uh, is the eventual hope. So they, they combine that um, issue about efficiency with being able to target it to the hardest hit communities. Okay. Um, to the panels, we've had a, a question that's just come in from um, one of the people joining us today about the possibility of needing boosters or needing shots beyond the, the, the two doses that, that are being recommended for the vaccines right now. Do you know anything, is it, have you heard any discussion about whether or not that is, that is gonna be necessary or, or what that might look like? We, we don't know yet. Um, there is evidence that antibodies last for at least eight months following vaccination. Um, we don't, you know, it, it just hasn't been around long enough. Um, and then there's the question of if a um, variant appears that, that the antibodies that you've made by vaccination don't neutralize, then you would need a booster just like we get with flu. Um, to address that new variant, but but right now we just don't know. Okay, and then there was a, another question that I, I had that came in about: Are there people that should not be getting this vaccine? Are there any recommendations in terms of whether they're immunocompromised or high risk for certain diseases? Are there any that we know that they they may need to to hold off on this particular vaccine? The people who should hold off on this vaccine are those who have a known, have had anaphylactic reaction, which is a the most severe form of an allergic reaction to one of the components of the vaccine. Now we say that and people go, well, I don't know what's in the vaccine. And uh, that's a reasonable thing for people to say. Um, the, the mRNA obviously is new and, the, and there are a lot of things in it for which you would be highly unlikely. There's sugar in it, there's salt in it. There's, you know, there are a lot of very common things which I'm sure you're not allergic to. Um, but there are uh, stabilizers. One of them, polyethylene glycol, is one that is common in vaccines. And so if you've had an anaphylactic reaction to a vaccine in the past, you may want to consult with your doctor first, to find out if there's a risk. And that's really the only um, firm contraindication. To the other part of the question, the people who have the greater health problems are really the ones who really need the vaccine more because if you should become infected, you're at greater risk of having a bad outcome. And then in terms of things that, that don't rise to the level of, of anaphylactic shock, are there any, what are the side effects that they're, they're seeing as they're, as they're tracking um, people? Well, I'll, I'll jump over, you know, it's, from my standpoint, we're seeing um, it in sort of in two columns. Um, well, I'll say three columns. So the, the one column is, you know, the anaphylaxis percent is very, very rare. In fact, the CDC put out a report oh, just about two weeks ago. Of the first 1.9 million Pfizer doses, there were 21 cases of anaphylaxis. That's literally one in 100,000. So a one in 100,000 chance of anaphylaxis based on that first data that came out through the CDC. So very, very rare. Uh, the next one is the usual sorts of side effects. Sore arm, maybe a little bit of fever, maybe some achiness, very similar to what you get with the, the flu. But the other one that I'm seeing, which uh, has caught me by surprise, is a lot of uh, people who I think they're just there's so much emotion about this and so much anxiety that we've had an, uh, a surprising number of, res of reports of people who, within a minute of getting the shot, they're getting lightheaded. Well, that's not the shot. The shot is not. There's no way. It's way too fast. There's no way possible that the injection that the vaccine is causing that. I think people are just carrying such a huge emotional load that when they get the shot. Somehow or another, they're just, I don't know whether they're just like, oh my God, thank God I got the shot. And, the, you know, or, or what is happening? But we're getting a lot of folks who are kind of getting this woozy thing that happens within seconds of getting the shot. Mm -hmm. And um, my heart goes out to them, but uh, trust me, it's, it's, it's not the vaccine. It hasn't been in you long enough. <laughs> One of the questions that, that I saw was um, related to um, taking uh, over-the-counter pain medicine for if arm soreness or something. Is there, um, is there any reason why people might not want to take something like ibuprofen or if, if after a shot in order to, um, to help with that pain? Is that, does that any, um, have any influence on the immune response that the, the body is, is supposed to be creating in response to the vaccine? So, so um, Dr. Teresa, feel free to join in, but what I understand, what I've read, it makes sense to me, is that with the anti-inflammatories, the non-steroidal inflammatories, this is your Motrin, your ibuprofen, your uh, Advil, Aleve, they are, um, they're non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. And so they slow down your inflammatory reaction, which is actually part of what you want to have happen. 
So I would not, I don't recommend that people take any of the non-steroidals. Um, Dr. Teresa, do you have anything more specific? No, I, you're right that the side effects that we're seeing that, um, well, I don't know about this. I guess the sore arm as well, but if you have a slight fever, if you feel achy, that's not the vaccine. That's your immune system reacting to the vaccine. So you don't want to tamp that down. Right. Yeah. So staying away from the non-steroidals like the ibuprofens would, would probably be a good idea. Right. Okay. Um, I, I, we're actually getting down to the last few minutes. And what I wanted to do was just um, to use that time to see if any of you um, had any uh, last thoughts on, on kind of what people really need to be thinking about as we go forward these, these next couple of months. Um, Dr. Linder. What, what, are, what are your thoughts on um, kind of uh, <laughs> this opportunity to, to talk to people that, that have questions about these vaccines? What, what would your advice be? What are your thoughts on this? Well, well um, in the last week, um, if we combine Harris County and the city of Houston, about 16,000 people were tested mm -hmm. um, for COVID. And 60% of them, or almost 10,000 of them, had no symptoms whatsoever, who were positive. So what's happening then is that we're seeing um, a high level of asymptomatic positivity, which is people who are carrying the infection, who don't know they are unless they're tested. And then they can take measures. They can, they can, they can self-isolate. Um, and they can inform the people they've been in contact with that, in fact, they're infected. And, and that becomes a really important control that we need to keep pursuing until the vaccine is fully distributed. And, and we're looking at, you know, the next six to eight months being really critical to not only damp down this, this last um, uh, peak on the last wave of infection uh, coming through the the, the Christmas, New Year's holidays, um, but that we, um, we get more control so that we can uh, loosen, uh, lessen the load on our healthcare providers and, and um, uh, have um, much more uh, possibility of returning to normalcy sooner um, if we're able to keep those um, measures in place. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Troisi? Yeah, I would um, suggest that, um, well, I would say there's a lot of misinformation about the vaccine out there, a lot of conspiracy theories. It is great to have questions, um, but what you need to do is go to a reliable source of information to get those questions answered. Um, your, your local or state health department, CDC, the big clinics like Mayo or Cleveland, or, you know, there's a lot of good information out there, uh, Facebook and Twitter, maybe not so much. Um, so number one is ask questions, you know, when you make a decision for yourself and, and get good information. The other thing I wanna emphasize is that um, I know um, there's a lot of relief when people get that first vaccine and um, I haven't gotten my second yet, but I know I will be very relieved. Uh, but it is important to remember that we are still going to have to do the same non-pharmaceutical interventions, masking, social distancing, environmental um, cleaning, washing your hands, um, you know, staying away from crowds, all that stuff, um, even after two doses. And um, it is, you know, getting that second dose is not a free-for-all. Dr. Purse? Yeah, well, first of all, I'd like to thank, you know, my colleagues on the show for uh, for coming together and doing this. And I think that to jump back on a little bit of what Dr. Sharwisi said is that it's getting good information out to people that is going to probably be one of the most important things that's going to get us, us through this. And so I want to thank the Health Museum for hosting this and you for moderating it. Um, we, we, it's really, it's you know, the most powerful thing we have in public health is public messaging. It's, um, you know, we, we those of us in public health, we look over the the last century or so, and we say that, you know, and it's true, we say, you know, vaccines have saved more lives than any other single medical intervention over the century. And that's absolutely true. When you look at the numbers, it's just exponentially more than any other medical intervention. But in order to get that done, in order to achieve that, we have to inform the public uh, with the best information that, that we have. And so I want to I thank you for that. And then the other thing I'd just like to say is that 
you know, going back to what I, one of the comments I made earlier is that, you know, this isn't rolling out as smoothly or as nicely as any of us uh, had hoped, but it, it is rolling out and mm -hmm. there are no bad actors. You're going to hear people blaming this on that one and blaming something else on somebody else. I have yet to come across anyone who is making a decision, um, certainly at the public health level, out of any sort of selfish or political place. We may be making it out of information that's 10 days later we find out was wrong, um, or we may come up with an idea that we try and turns out that wasn't such a great idea, but there's no bad actors. But uh, right now our rate limiting step is the amount of vaccine. And if you think of it, I've said there's, there's three links in this chain. There's the, the amount of vaccine, there are our tactics and strategies and um, activities to get vaccine into people's arms, and then there's the desire for vaccine from the public. At any given time, one of those three links will be the rate limiting step. Today, it's the amount of vaccine. I fear the day when it is that we don't have people who want to get vaccine and we have plenty of it to give. And at some point, I know it's going to be, you know, our, we're going to have more vaccine than we can actually get into the clinics and stuff. That, that will happen at some point. But at any given time, one of those three things will be the rate limiting step. And you know what? As a community, we just have to recognize that, roll with that punch, get over that hurdle, move on to the next thing, and just keep on trucking. Yeah. Again, I want to thank you all so much for for taking time out of your very busy schedules. Um, I, I know it's just it must be crazy for you this past year with um, with all the work that you're doing. But I want to thank you on behalf of the museum and the community. Um, I also want to thank uh, again our partners, um, UT School of Public Health, UTMB Health, and the Institute for Translational Sciences and Baylor College of Medicine for making this possible. And um, I, again, I want to thank all of you that joined us today. Um, please, if you have additional questions, um, continue to send them in. You can always send them to the museum and we'll be continuing in the coming months to make additional information available, particularly around this, this uh, topic of, of vaccination and, and not just the COVID vaccination, but vaccinations in general, which as Dr. Purse pointed out, are, are incredibly important for public health and our community health. So again, thank you so much. And, and we hope to see you again at one of our programs, be it virtual or, or later in the year in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.